Uh, uh, Chuck, uh, when's your birthday? You don't have to tell us if you don't want to. Uh, September 20th, a long time ago. Oh, that's right when uh, the, the, the earth turns from uh, summer to fall. Uh, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, well, very good. Hey, when, when is your last day in Charleston this year? Uh, I believe it's March the 9th. March 9th, and crossover day is uh, is when? It, it, was that yesterday? I think it's actually tomorrow. Last, uh, bill, All bills had to be out of committee of, in the House of Origin, I think, yesterday. All right, Chuck. And uh, are you getting anything through this year? Anything that would make Brad Null happy, for instance? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, I, uh, the one bill uh, that removes the uh, or clarifies that there's no sales tax on uh, uh, re- lower receivers, uh, that that is done, completed legislation to the governor. Wait, no, um, no sales tax on what? On on lower receivers for firearms. The the part that's considered a firearm, say on an AR-15, and gotcha. also on some pistols and what have you. Okay, um, very good. It's it's a clarification from when we when we passed that bill a couple of years ago that we removed sales tax from uh, uh, firearms, small arms, and ammunition. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, because I was thinking taller receivers like Travis Kelsey would have to pay the tax. He is a tall receiver. And then um, got another one that's waiting on concurrence. We we passed it out of the House. The Senate passed it with an amendment. So we're we're going to we should concur on it sometime this week, which uh, is is a bill that will uh, basically prohibit uh, municipalities from using using their zoning ordinance. To zone gun 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 stores out of particular areas that that basically it makes it so that they can't use that against gun stores uh, if they're not using it against other businesses as well. Has that been an issue in West Virginia? Well, there was some issue with it in Morgantown uh, last year. They passed an ordinance to allow them to do that, and uh, I believe they moved one gun store out and stopped a uh, pretty big gun store from coming to Morgantown. Uh, and it may it may have some implications in Charleston. I'm not 100 percent sure. And, and where is that bill now, Chuck? That is uh, um, waiting on House concurrence on a uh, Senate amendment to it. OK. And I know you had some uh, work that you were doing on the homestead exemption, trying to get that up to fifty thousand uh, dollars. I think those HJR 16. D- did that get anywhere? <laughs> No, that uh, that was I think dead in the water. I think no chance. Uh, regretfully, um, I did have um, I did have a bill up that that was kind of nice. It was on uh, judiciary uh, agenda, and that was to change our civil asset forfeiture mm-hmm. to uh, criminal asset seizure or criminal asset forfeiture, uh, basically to require a criminal conviction before. Uh, the sheriff's department or whatever agency could uh, keep keep one's property that they seize, say in a in a drug bust. Uh, right right now right now there's there's really no guardrails on on what can be done there, uh, and it doesn't actually require a criminal conviction. And uh, this would put some guardrails on it, but um, they pulled it from objection from the sheriff's association. Come back on the agenda a week later. Uh, they pulled it again, but uh, right now I'm a cautiously optimistic. I got everybody coming to the table to work on this to hopefully have something for next session. Uh, what is the biggest piece of legislation that you think will get through the House and be signed by the Senate that's still out there right now, Chuck? What are some things like that? Uh, the biggest piece, I don't know. It's really kind of hard to tell. It's been a weird session. It's, yep. it's not like a lot of big items jumped out. Uh, I think maybe one of the bigger pieces that kind of catches my eye is uh, the final elimination of Social Security tax by the state. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not even sure where that bill is at right now, but uh, but I uh, I expect that bill to move, or maybe it has moved. Uh, I haven't paid attention to see exactly where it's at, uh, but but that's a piece that 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 I think was kind of a big deal. Um, and then there's I don't know there's, there's quite a few social type issues. Um, which some of them I like, uh, some of them I'm just like, eh, eh okay, on, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I suppose. But uh, it's been kind of a kind of a strange session, I guess. And in, in that sense, uh, since I've been elected, it, it, there's always been some really 
like I, I refer to them as big ticket items. Right. And it just doesn't seem like the big ticket items are there this year. There doesn't seem to be as much friction either between the legislature and the governor this year. Each session seems to have been marked by some type of friction between the governor in the past and either the Senate or the House or him playing one against the other. And I've not heard any of that this year, Chuck. Well, yeah, you're kind of correct on that. I didn't really give out any thought, but yeah, you're you're correct. Like last year, there was there was a lot of friction about the uh, uh, income tax bill, <clears throat> and was that last year, or year before? I don't know. It all runs together on me now anymore. Sure. Uh, but but yeah, you're correct. It's uh, been kind of quiet from the governor's office from from what I've seen and heard. Do you think the lack of friction has to do with the fact that he's in the middle of a Senate race and he doesn't want to? You know, he doesn't want an uproar. He wants everybody just to sort of get along and keep his party uh, unified behind him. Do you think that's part of it? Well, I, I mean, it could be. Uh, you know, that I'd just be speculating, but it, it's very possible. Uh, certainly election years uh, uh, change change uh, attitudes and how, how some react or how some – legislation will move or won't move and what have you. So, so yeah, a lot of people, um, you know, consider that. How many terms have you served now? I'm just finishing my second term. Oh, okay. Because I'm wondering, I, I'm, I'm new to the area too, you're new to the legislature. I'm wondering if it's not an alternating year thing where all the controversial stuff comes in right after people are elected and then it goes kind of softball during the election year that follows. And that could be to some degree, although I don't know. I, at the end of my first term, it seemed like we've done quite a, quite a bit of good stuff as well. So I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, and like I say, I, you know, I've got three years behind me, and this is about to be the fourth one. So I don't have a lot of uh, experience on that. So a bill's clear the House, and then they head off to the Senate. Is there... Is it, a, is it a surprise to find out what's going to live through the Senate and what's not, or are there in, indicators along the way? Are there conference committees and such that, 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 that well, keep a, I don't know. a finger I, on the pulse? I, I, I view it as you just never know what's going to happen when it gets to the other side, and, and I take it the Senate looks at it probably the same way. Now, on, on, on I guess what I describe as big-ticket items, I think there's a lot of uh, working together between the House and the Senate, and and a lot of times those big ticket items are are, are kind of known what's going to happen with them when they get passed out of one chamber. Uh, but a, a lot of the other stuff, um, I don't know. I, I guess it's kind of up in the air. Chuck, uh, was there a vote over the weekend in regards to vaccines and extending some exemptions in West Virginia? Uh, yes, that the uh, the final vote for that was yesterday, I believe. Uh, yeah, that was yesterday. That bill was yesterday. Um, Can you explain the bill to us? Okay, um, I'm not familiar with all the wording in it, but 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 the gist of the bill was it started out as a uh, um, to, to remove the vaccine requirement for those attending uh, a, a virtual school, which really seemed kind of bizarre that they would have to have that for virtual. But uh, I guess because of the way the law was originally written, they did. And then there was an amendment offered by Delegate Kirby on Friday, I believe it was, that would apply a religious exemption to um, across the board to all schools. And that passed, uh, I think it was passed with 62 yays and 30 couple nay votes. So then the bill yesterday had that exemption included in it. And it passed yesterday 57 to, I don't remember how many nays there was, but there, there were 57 yays that, that passed it. Did you vote for both versions? Yes, I did. Uh, what was your reasoning for voting for both of those? Well, my reasoning is, is simply this. I, I, I look at it as a liberty-type issue, and I'm very big on liberty. And I just view it, if, if, if you're forced to inject something into your body that you don't want, I guess the question becomes, do you really have any liberty at that point? And uh, that, that's that's really where I stood on it. In your view, does that include measles and polio and smallpox, the sort of classics from our youth? Well, actually, yeah, I, I guess it does in my view. And um, 
you know, I'm not I'm not disputing that those vaccines are good or bad. I'd, I'd say that many of those old vaccinations are, are probably actually tried and tried, true and proven, I guess. Um, and then on on the flip side of that, I don't see this exemption really making much of a difference. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to say that uh, I don't want my my child to have this vaccination. I think most parents will continue to get their children vaccinated. And uh, the the vaccination rate, I don't think, changes very much in the state. The exemption would include the measles, mumps, rubella, polio vaccines, correct? No, a, a parent with this legislation would not have to accept any vaccines to go to public school, have their children go to public school, correct? To my knowledge, that is correct. And this meant, this then moves on to the Senate? Yes. Do you have any temperature of the room in the Senate as to how this will be treated there? No, actually, I do not. Um, other than uh, I don't know that the Senate, I just, my gut feeling, and it's just a gut feeling, my gut feeling is it does not survive the Senate, at least in its current form. What do you think would have to be amended from it for it to pass the Senate, Chuck? Well, I, I suspect what will happen on the Senate side is they'll they'll remove that amendment, that re- religious exemption, I suspect. John, you breathed and, hard. Yeah. I, <laughs> and, and, and that's if they take it up at all. They may not even take it up. How does it happen? Um, take the teacher carry bill that had unanimous uh, approval by the supermajority in the House. And from what we're hearing, it's scheduled to land with kind of a thud in the Senate where there's also a supermajority. What are the, the political um, logistics of that? It just it seems odd that you can have unanimity <clears throat> among Republicans in one house and then problems with a supermajority Republican in the other house. Um, and, and, and I haven't heard anything on how the Senate's going to react to that bill. Um, uh, um, I know, um, you know, there, there's there's some people lobbying them. Um, it's an election year. I don't know that I don't know that the Senate destroying that bill or, or, or voting that bill down is going to be a good play for for many of them during an election year. Now, of course, only half the Senate is up for election this year. So um, I'm just not really sure how that's going to play out on that side either. It's, um, you know, I, I, I kind of think think about it some and um, it's it's just a tough call for me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Chuck Hurst is our guest here, delegate from the 95th District. <laughs> Excuse me. Chuck, I want to go back to a few other uh, parts of legislation that you were uh, proposing. And one had to do with moving the first day of gun season to the uh, for, for deer to the Saturday before Thanksgiving holiday. This seems like a fairly innocuous bill, a, a layup. Is is this something that's going to get passed? Um, no, I, I did not run that in committee. Um, I actually held it back. There's a, a, a need. Actually, I want to work with the DNR on that a little bit. Um, and they have some information where they have, uh, uh, I guess, asked that question of constituents before. And uh, surprisingly, they're telling me that it was overwhelmingly that people did not want to change that when they really? had that question before. Hmm. What was the reasoning? Um, Any idea? Well, I, it seemed to be that a lot of it was just tradition, um, which I don't know that that's a good reason necessarily. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it, to, to me it just seems like a no-brainer to have it come in on the weekend to help those people out that are that, that are required to work during the week and can't get that time off. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's always how I viewed that one. Plus extra meat um, for the Thanksgiving yeah. holiday. Oh, yeah, and less deer to hit on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm all yeah, for anything that includes killing more deer with something other than my car, Chuck. So any any way you can thin the herd is okay by me. Well, and and and, and as soon as I'm done here, I'm having a meeting with some uh, DNR uh, 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 biologists uh, uh, about uh, just to find out a little bit more. And and I got a few questions about some things I want to ask them. Um, and I'm also working with DNR to. to I, I had a bill to. Uh, um, during the youth season, which is usually an early season that youth hunters can uh, uh, 
uh, hunt with a rifle for eh, it's a two or three day season um, to allow them to take a buck. Currently, they've only been allowed to harvest a doe during that season, and I had a bill to to uh, do that. And then uh, DNR talked with me, the upper management of DNR, and uh, I chose not to run that bill. They're they're going to work on that um, through rules and hopefully have that uh, accomplished by this by this fall. What a, what about um, I I got a question. We, we've talked about a lot of general stuff through the state. What have you guys pushed that will directly benefit the Eastern Panhandle? You know the area that basically financially supports a lot of the state. Have we had any traction on any sort of locality pay or anything, which I believe is the most important thing for the Eastern Panhandle? Is I mean, as always, we see our our teachers leaving and. You know, tough to get state workers in this area. I mean, I was talking to a state trooper the other day that said this is the area nobody wants to be in because it costs so much to live. Even though they're getting a little more money out here now, it costs so much money to live. Has, was there any traction? Was does anybody push for that? Uh, and and I, there's also I don't know if you've seen it on Route 45. There's a huge billboard that talks about you get eighty seven thousand dollars to be a Hagerstown police. Oh officer. yeah. So yeah, you know, locality pay is becoming an issue. I mean, we, we're uh, losing teachers right and left. It, 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 it's been an issue. There's no no question about that. I'm not aware of anything that has been moving that deals with the locality pay this year. Um, I don't, and, and to be quite honest, I don't think the votes would be in the House for it right now. It's one of the things we need. I don't know what we need to do. We need to get some delegates, some delegates' minds changed on that some way, shape, or form. And I'm I'm not quite sure how we really accomplish that. Well, I mean, there's, there's, I can I can tell you how to accomplish delegate. it, Chuck. I can tell you how to accomplish it very easily. The rest of the state, a lot of the rest of the state, gets propped up by the tax dollars from the income tax of the people in the Eastern Panhandle. We are growing like crazy. Houses are popping up. Developments are popping up in all three counties out here now. Every time a new development pops up, more people move from Maryland, more people move from Northern Virginia, more high incomes that are taxed here in West Virginia, more money that goes down to the state. If we don't have teachers and we don't have good schools in the Eastern Panhandle, people will not continue to come here and continue to add to the tax base that helps prop up a lot of counties in West Virginia. It's just math. Well, I'm certainly not going to argue against you on that. I mean, um, I know that to be factual information. There's no question about that. It's just getting the votes in the House. I'm not sure how, how it even looks in the Senate, but, but in House, it just has always been underwater. There is just a big block of delegates that just want the exact same thing for their constituents regardless uh, and it just seems to be no change in many of their minds. Uh, you know, it's just, um, you know, we, we have quite a few votes. It's just we don't have the 51 that's needed. And, John, how does, I, I agree with everything you said, but how is that a compelling argument for the representatives from Pocahontas County or Mingo County? Why, why are they, what is their parochial interest in making sure that, that, the Eastern Panhandle continues to grow other than the fact that it keeps the money flowing, but the money's already flowing. Yeah. But the more, I mean, the more people we have, the more high income people we have, the more money there is for them to, for them to take down there. I mean, those counties, the, the, uh, the poorer counties in our state get a lot more money back than they're putting in, whereas we are getting less back here than we're putting in. Has anybody ever proposed to maybe have more autonomy for the schools where our tax dollars stay here to support <clears throat> our schools and say the tax dollars in McDowell or Pocahontas or Taylor or any of those counties just stay with them and they support their own schools? Have we looked at maybe just a more autonomous pay system? Yes, I've I've kind of suggested a number of times that we need a really big tax re scheme rewrite and to 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 allow more money to stay locally so so that it that that this issue could actually be addressed locally rather than going to Charleston and then having to come back. Um uh, <laughs> and 
and that that's probably an awful heavy lift because there's probably an awful lot of change that would have to be done in the tax code to accomplish something like that. But I don't disagree with you. I mean that that would be the that would be the real fix. You know, it wouldn't be taking anything from anybody. It would just be allowing um, the local regions or, or or the counties, probably countywide, I guess, to uh, have have more control of, of of their money and do with with that money what is necessary for 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 the county in particular. I mean, I know four or five. I personally know five great teachers who were 10, 20-year teachers here in the Eastern Panhandle who've left in the last two years for Maryland and Virginia. because You're, you're uh, preaching to the choir, though, John. I mean, I mean, Chuck agrees with you. Right? I mean, Chuck, what – I mean, <laughs> why don't – I mean, why is it not in the forefront? Why, why is it not pushed more? I mean, I, I know there are a lot of things, and I know it's kind of a – uh, it, it, it's, I mean, it would be a, a Herculean task to get it done, but why is it not pushed more? Well, again, again, it comes down to votes. If you don't have, if you don't have the numbers there, you can, you can push all day long and not get nowhere. Um, and, and certainly this, this issue is not dead. It's just, um, maybe, maybe after this upcoming election with perhaps some changes, Maybe the landscape will look a lot differently next session. Um, I, hate, I, I hope the landscape looks a lot differently. I want to get off this topic because we can't get anywhere with it any further. And be, I want to ask a couple questions, Chuck, before you go. And one of those had to do with your uh, bill that had to do with private lands and warrantless searches. Did that get anywhere this year? Not really. Uh, or warrantless it, entry. We passed, yeah, we, we passed it out of Natural Resources Committee. And judiciary failed to put it on the agenda. Um, Did thirty? And then go go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to say, and then and then they, the 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 part popped up where they put that other bill of mine on the agenda that I had a lot of interest in as well, although I wasn't pushing that one. So I I ended up spending time on that one there where. I should have probably been pushing the open fields or the warrantless search bill. Did 34 single member Senate districts get anywhere? No, no, that did not. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of appetite for constitutional amendments after the last time <laughs> of four of them being shot down by the voters. Uh, although the House did pass one, I don't know where that's where it's at in the Senate right now, and that was to. Uh, uh, put into the constitution that euthanasia is uh, uh basically not allowed in the state of west virginia john final uh, gilstrap final question for chuck you had a comment a moment ago yeah i did i'm just wondering you you deal with a much broader spectrum of west virginians than than i do right you you deal with folks from all over the state do you get the sense that there is there's comfort in some parts of of the state where wild and wonderful also just means um, poverty and no growth is that poverty take poverty out of that the, the zero growth or slow growth is actually the goal of some parts of the state I'm not sure it's the goal but I can tell you there's parts of the state there's definitely counties in the state or at least representatives of, of said counties that really don't want that kind of growth I don't believe um and even even getting up our way, there, there's some that aren't keen on wanting to see the growth that, that we've had there in the Eastern Panhandle. Hey, Chuck, thanks so much uh, for your time this morning, man. Final thought is yours. Is there anything else you wanted to tell the audience members up here that, uh, that they need to know about? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure at the moment, other than uh, those couple Liberty bills of mine with the civil asset forfeiture and the, open, or the warrantless search bill. Uh, I'm certainly going to continue to work on them and, and press hard for them next uh, next session. Chuck, thanks, man. Have a good day. All right. Thank you, guys. Now look at Chuck Hurst.